Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is James Shore. I wrote a book called The Art of Agile Development, and I'm a programmer. Uh, lately, I've been working, I've always tended to work with entrepreneurial companies, and lately, I have been working with companies that have been successful enough that they've been able to grow. And in looking at how they're growing and what they're growing into, discovering that a lot of the material about how to scale Agile is not very good. And so I would like to share some of that information with you today. But to make it a little more interesting, I'm going to tell this as a story. A story about growth and success and the consequences and failures that can come from that success. Uh, what can go wrong and also what you can do to make it go right. So, once upon a time, there was a company Software as a service company, and uh, a couple of people with a bright idea, and they codenamed their product Sloth because Liz, their tech co-founder, uh, loved sloths. And there we are. The product is intriguing, and it attracts angel uh, investment, and they're able to hire people to uh, help them build it. They, they uh, Liz hires a few front-end developers, a UX designer couple of back-end developers, and she's ready to crank up production. But how is she going to organize that work? How is she going to have these people work together? Well, the obvious way is to take her team, her uh, six or so developers, and to split them into lanes by specialty. And then assign out the tasks for the feature that she wants to work on to, to those various lanes. Have any of you done this? It's a fairly common, obvious thing to do. So that's what she does. But the problem is, is that one lane has fewer tasks and they get done a little bit faster than everyone else. And this always happens. This always happens because it's not possible for everything to be perfectly balanced. So what do you do? Well, Liz has got work to do. She's got investors to please. So of course she wants her people to be effective and efficient. And so she grabs the next feature off the list, and she splits that up. And that doesn't balance out quite perfectly either. And now things are starting to get a little bit messy. But these are professionals. They keep on working. There's slots to feed. So they keep on going. Inevitably, one lane discovers that uh, some sort of mistake, uh, something that doesn't mesh together perfectly, and it needs to be reworked. And now tasks start coming back from the dead. Eventually, Liz's team is juggling tasks from three different features, uh, multitasking constantly, and they're not getting anything done. Multitasking is a productivity killer. Uh, have you seen this? Those of you who work in this style, have you seen this? Oh yeah, ba basically everybody who raised their hand before is raising, raising their hands again. So Liz looks for a better way. She wants a way of working where she doesn't have to deal with the constant multitasking, the tasks coming back from the bed, and nothing getting done. And what she discovers is extreme programming, XP. Collective ownership, continuous integration, uh, self-organization, pair programming, although the developers on our team don't really think pair programming is a good idea, so they don't want to do that. And she tries it. So now, tasks are distributed to the team, not to individuals. Uh, there's no lanes. Of course, she still has specialists. And I've color-coded them light blue and dark blue here. And there's tasks that apply to various specialties. But because the team is the resource, the tasks just go out to everybody. And the team members self-organize to work out who does what amongst themselves. And naturally, people take tasks that align with their specialty, but they don't let themselves get too far ahead. When somebody gets too far ahead of the other uh, people on the team, they go back and they help out. And this does mean that some tasks take longer, but prevent, it prevents rework 
and tests uh, raising back from the dead. And the feature is done sooner overall. And that makes the slot happy. The multitasking goes away, quality of life goes up. The team's so happy they actually try to decide to give pairing a try. And what do they what do they find? They are able to get those cross-functional tasks done faster, code quality goes up, and they're getting stuff done much faster. Now they're not just forming features, they're forming stories. They can start and finish a story in a day by everybody working on it together. Uh, sometimes two, sometimes less. Investors are happy too, because previously they were working on three features at a time. Let's, let's take an example. We've got three features. They each take two months, and you're working on them all in parallel. What's going to happen? Well, two times three, that's six months. Actually, it takes longer than that in the old model, because multitasking is a productivity killer. So it takes longer than six months, but let's pretend that multitasking is free, that it, there's no cost involved here. So after six months, they've made, let's say each feature is worth a million dollars a month. It's a startup, they've got big plans. So after the seventh month, they've made mm, $3 million. Now in the new model, they work on one feature at a time. They get it done, all uh, work on it until it's done, they get it done, and they start making that million dollars a month, or however much it really is, while they work on the next feature. And they work on that second feature and get that done and start making money from that feature. And then they work on the third feature, get it done. They get the features done in the same amount of time. Actually, it's faster because multitasking is a productivity killer. So let's pretend that doesn't matter. They get it done faster. Uh, they get it done in the same amount of time. And at the end, they've made two months of free money just because they're focusing their work. <coughs> So Liz is happy too, and the investors are happy. Now, lest you think this is a fairy tale, I want to share an example from a real project. Uh, this was written up in a book called Software by Numbers by Mark Denny and, Mike, uh, and Jane Cleland Quang. They studied a project at, I believe, Hewlett Packard. This project was done over the course of five years. Uh, it ended. In the fifth year, it had two releases. I don't know why there were two releases, I presume, because one was a bug fix release. It cost $4.3 million to develop. It brought in $5.6 million. And it, uh, they ended its investment back at a rate roughly equivalent to putting the money in a bank and getting a 12.8% rate of return. That's that bottom number there. That is a lousy result for software development, which is incredibly risky. So. Mark and Jane uh, took this project and they studied what would have happened if they had released once a year every five years. Most notably, the cost of development goes up by nearly half a million dollars because it costs more to ship more frequently. But the cash investment required goes down because they're making money from that first release and using that to fund the second release. So the cash investment, the third line goes down. Revenue goes up because they're making money longer. And the internal rate of return is 36%. That's a very healthy result. Now, I saw some people's eyes glazing over. This is a coding conference. I'm not going to bore you with these kinds of details. The bean counters are very happy with this sort of stuff. Just tell you that. So the team is happier. Liz's team is happier because they're not seeing the multitasking. They're not having tasks coming back from the dead. They're not getting nothing done because they're constantly juggling all these tasks. Liz is happier because her team is developing faster. And uh, the investors are happier because they are making more money from doing the same thing. And they're getting done faster, which is helping as well. So the lesson, the moral of the story here, team is the resource. If you have a team and you're successful and you want to grow, don't split them into lanes, but instead consider the team to be the resource. But there is a deeper lesson here. And that deeper lesson here is that software matters. If you listen to people talk about how do you manage software projects, they, what they'll tell you is, here's how you manage any project. 
But that doesn't actually work because we're developing software here and we have to be aware of how software works. And if we want to be successful, we have to apply that knowledge about how software works. So Liz's team lives happily ever after, right? Well, not quite. Uh, their success leads to growth. And that growth leads to other problems. But um, in the meantime, they had so much success with the basic XP practices of continuous integration and collective ownership that they started applying to their programming, test-driven development, refactoring, <laughs> evolutionary design, uh, uh, continuous delivery. They're very happy. Let's come back to that. This rocket is carrying the Mars Climate Orbiter. It's December 11, 1998. So the spaceship at the top of this rocket is going to study water distribution and atmosphere on Mars. After launch, it is going to spend 286 days in space. It's going to travel 669 million kilometers, and it's going to arrive at Mars on September 23rd, 1999. Upon arrival, it's going to fire its main engines for 16 minutes, 23 seconds to slow into orbit, and then it's going to use its solar panels to drag against Mars's atmosphere to gradually turn that highly elliptical orbit into a regular uh, circular orbit. So here we are, it's December 11, 1998. The spaceship costs $193.1 million to develop, $91.7 million for this launch, and $42.8 million have been budgeted for mission operations. Total cost is $327.6 million. It is part of NASA's smaller, cheaper, faster program. <laughs> 286 days later, it's September 23rd, 1999, 9 o'clock and 46 seconds universal coordinated time. The main engines fire. 9.04, 52 seconds, communication is lost. That's okay, this is expected. The spacecraft is gonna pass behind Mars and the shadow of Mars is to prevent the radio signals from reaching Earth, so this is expected. But it's one minute and eight seconds too early. So I can only imagine that the air in the, uh, in the mission control room is tense as they wait for the rocket, or for the spaceship to come back out from behind Mars shadow. How come communication was lost early? Are they going to see the spacecraft again? It's due to return at 9.27 and 0 seconds. The minutes tick by. 9 9.24, 9.25, 9.26, 9.27. 9.28. Communication is never reestablished, and a few days later, the mission is declared a total loss. 327.6 million, countless, countless years of work down the drain. NASA's being, NASA being NASA, of course, they investigate the problem. What went wrong? Well, they figure out what happened. The spacecraft entered, uh, the spacecraft trajectory was just a little bit off. Uh, rather than coming around Mars, it sort of ran into Mars. Uh, it collided, it, it entered the atmosphere and burned up. Uh, why? Well, one team produced results in pound seconds of force. That's the U.S. units. The team that was using that uh, team's result expected the value to be in newton seconds of force. And that little difference resulted in a burn being just a little bit too long and the trajectory being just a little bit off and the spacecraft burning up in the atmosphere. Moral of this story, if it can happen to NASA, it can happen to you. Cross-team dependencies, cross-team interactions are slow and error prone. Which brings us back to Liz and her team. They've been successful enough that now they have to grow and they can't have all those people on just one team. They need two teams. Which means that now 
she has to worry about cross-team dependencies. How many of you are in environments where you work with multiple teams? Yeah, so this may be relevant to your interests. Some of you are not raising your hands, in which case I can only say, someday I hope you're successful enough that it is relevant to your interests. <laughs> now I want to make a definition. Uh, people talk about scaling Agile all the time. But the people who talk about this tend to talk about enterprise agile. And what they're really focusing on is how do you get people in a large company to do what we know is good practices. That's not what I'm worrying about. You know how to do agile well. The question isn't how do you do agile well or how do you get people to do it. The question is how do you deal with these cross-team issues? So I'm going to define large-scale agile as a system of interdependent teams. If you have 500 people in an IT organization and they're all working on their own projects, that's big. It's enterprise, but it's not large-scale agile because they're not interdependent. Liz, on the other hand, she's got two teams, but they depend on each other to get their work done. So it's a small example of large-scale agile. It's in the class of problems that I would call large-scale agile because now you've got teams who depend on each other to work. So it's not size, it's the interdependencies. So Liz's company is growing, she needs to make two teams. What does she do? Well, we're programmers. And there's an obvious way to split things when we have a more complicated problem. What do we do in our code when our, when our code gets more complicated? We refactor. And how do we generally do it? Well, we tend to split by layer. We tend to take the front end and the back end and we divide them up. It's the obvious thing to do. It's also wrong. Because what's right for people What's right for code is not right for people. Code has perfect instantaneous communication, except for microservices. <laughs> people don't. We don't have perfect instantaneous communication. So when you split a feature, when you split a team into two teams by layer, what you're doing is you're maximizing dependencies. You're taking every single feature that you're going to work on from that point forward, and you're basically splitting your team into lanes, like Liz had in the beginning. Every feature now is going to require two teams to coordinate with, to coordinate with each other in order to get their work done. The natural conclusion of this uh, can be seen in a company I'm working with right now. They've got several dozen teams. I can't tell you how big they are, but I am allowed to tell you that there are 300 people in the office that I'm working with the most. And for many years, they've been growing and being very successful. And they got angel funding and then venture capital and then another round of venture capital. And they've gone public. And the results of that years and years of growth looks like this. I am not kidding. <laughs> This is a real diagram. We got all the engineering managers and all the tech leads from all the teams in a room. And we said, write down who you depend on and how, and put, it on a, on, put the teams on cards, and, draw, and then put the cards on a piece of paper, and draw lines between the cards. And that's the result. This is what happens. And they, also, they were also uh, doing a lot of work, uh, lane-based work, where the teams would, you know, not swarm their MMS or their features, which, which makes things a little more challenging. Anyway, that's, that's what you get. So the lesson here is uh, don't do that. Don't split your teams by level. But what do you do instead? Well, this is the problem that I've been working on. And um, so I've been working with this company. It's, it's not just theory. This is something that I actually work on with teams. This is a, I can't show you the details, so I fuzzed this out, but this is the same spaghetti diagram, cleaned up. We took out every team that wasn't part of the product organization. We took out every team that everybody just naturally depended on for various reasons. And this is the result. Then over the course of several months, we worked with a lot of influential people in the company, a lot of the engineers in the company, and said, how can we reduce the dependencies between teams. And this is the result we came up with. 
that is a fairly substantial difference. There's 42 uh, teams that I'm working with in this company, although only about half of them are shown on these two diagrams. And uh, that's the kind of results that we got. So what I want to share with you in the rest of this talk is the techniques for reducing dependencies so you can see these sorts of results. Now maybe you're not in a company this large, maybe you're in a company this larger, and they're all working on the same project, so it's, or products, so it's large-scale algebra problem. But either way, the solution to this problem depends on actually caring that this is software that we're building, that this is about code. So although I'm not going to be showing you any lines of code in this talk, this is still very much a coding-centric conversation, because this only only makes sense in software development. It's not generic project management. So it's not just theory, but I do have to admit it's not entirely proven either. Uh, if you look at something like extreme programming or Scrum or any of the other agile methods, they're fairly well understood. There's books out there about them, and you can, if you have a single team and you meet the preconditions required to do, say, extreme programming, you can basically do it by the book and see success. It takes some time, it takes some effort, you have to figure out how to do it, but it's well understood. These large-scale agile concepts, I don't feel like we're there yet. Uh, we're, I'm still developing my understanding of what to do, and uh, the ideas are continually evolving. So this is based on real experience with real companies and real teams, and there's still more to learn. So what this is here today is me talking to you about what I've learned. There's no courses, there's no certification, I don't have a fancy website. It's just sharing what I've learned. Uh, if you need to give it a name, I don't have a fancy name either. If you, if you need to give it a name though, you can call it the Shore Model. And because this is constantly evolving, um, it's the May 2016 edition. So, so take these ideas, uh, try them out, let me know what you think, and then it'll be you talking to me about what you've learned. I'll steal your best ideas, I'll try them out, and then I come back next year, we'll talk about the 2017 edition. All right, now let's get back to Liz's problem. She needs to have two teams, but she doesn't want the dependencies that you get from splitting by layer. And before I move on, I need to define dependency. I don't mean that you're using somebody else's software. Now, if you use Amazon's cloud services, technically they're a dependency for your team, but you don't let their roadmap determine what you ship. If you use Microsoft Word, you don't let Microsoft's roadmap determine when you write things. Similarly, a dependency in this environment is only a dependency if you need to wait for the other team to do something for you in order to get the work done. Or if there's quality problems where when you use their stuff, it's not reliable and you have to wait for them to fix the bug before you can, before you can use it. So that's a dependency. So what does Liz do in this situation? She's got this idea doesn't think it's going to be a good idea. She looks out at the Agile literature and she finds feature teams. This has been around for quite a while. I think I originally saw it in Craig uh, Box Bode and Craig Larman's book back in 2006, 2004, I don't remember, about large-scale Agile. It's feature teams. And the idea here is that you've got a bunch of different teams that can work on any part of the code base. The organization as a whole has collective ownership of the entire system, and there's one backlog of features, and whenever a, feature, whenever a team finishes a feature, they take the next feature off the backlog, and they start working on it. How many of you have, have tried this? Not that many people. About 10% of the room. Feature teams are distinguished from teams that work on a particular area of the system in that they have collective ownership of all the code base. So any team can work on any part of the code. And this is a very agile idea. The idea from extreme programming of collective ownership that anybody on the team can work on any part of the team's code makes a lot of sense. It works really well when we're talking about swarming features. 
However, Liz tries this, and she discovers code quality problems. What she learns is that when multiple teams are sharing responsibility for code quality, and because everybody's always under schedule pressure, because we're software developers and we are always, always under schedule pressure, what they do is they say, I don't have time to fix this problem right now. The other team will take care of it. And the same exact team will say, this other team gave me crap code. I'm not going to fix their problems. And they don't, they don't get that they're saying the same thing in two completely different ways. And this is just human nature. Human nature is to form tribes and then to throw poo at each other. <laughs> We're primates. That's what we do. Now, I can't say for a fact that, collective, uh, that feature teams and collective ownership doesn't work, but this is what I've seen from the teams that have tr from the companies that have tried it. Uh, those of you who raised your hands, those of you doing feature teams, who have done feature teams, have you seen the same experience? Seeing some hands go up. Michael Feathers uh, has expressed the same concern that, that uh, he, he's concerned that he has seen problems with people doing this sort of collective ownership across teams with code quality. One of, the, one of the things that's really key for the XP practices to work, for the Agile engineering practices to work, is continuous improvement of the code. Uh, some people call it the campsite rule. You never leave the code worse than you found it. And for that to work, collective ownership and refactoring and test-driven development are important practices. But if you've got people flinging poo at each other and you have this sort of human dynamic of not taking responsibility for code that other people wrote, I don't think collective ownership can work. So Liz tries out the feature teams. She's not happy with the results. Code quality is going downhill. So instead, she tries something else. Uh, this is confusingly also called feature teams by some people, but I'm going to call it full ownership teams. A full ownership team is a, vertic a team responsible for a vertical slice of the application where they have everything they need to do every single part of the code base. So um, in, in Liz's case, uh, so they're cross-functional, they're vertical integration, there's, uh, there's some duplication of effort that happens in this environment because the people are working on uh, entirely separate code bases, and when they solve the same problems, they might write code to solve the, those problems in, uh, write, both write code to solve that problem. And uh, very importantly, the code bases are not shared across teams in this model. So, Tim take, uh, so Liz takes her, her project, her sloth product, and splits it into an administrative component so one team is going to be responsible for all of the administrative elements of the, of the code base. Another team is going to be responsible for the product itself, the actual, uh, what people see when they come to the site. The lesson here is rather than creating feature teams, uh, rather than sharing ownership across teams, create full ownership teams instead. Liz's team continues to succeed and to grow. And soon she gets to the point where she wants to add another team, a third team. But right now she's got an administration team and she's got the actual products team. And she wants to take that actual product team and split it up into one team that's going to be responsible for sort of the uh, out of the box experience, the landing page, the sign up page, accounts, and another team that's responsible for the logged in experience, what you see when you're paying for the product and they're actually logged in. But she's got some technical debt problems. There's a bit of a big ball of mud here. And so she can't have all of those people working on just one. Uh, they, she can't split it cleanly yet. So what does she do? Well, what she decides is she decides to go ahead and share ownership. She creates those joint commit rights into the code base, which means that uh, she can have multiple teams that are each responsible for their, her, their own areas of the system, but share rights to the same code base. Or she could use the Vadi and Larman style feature teams where there's one backlog and they pull off. 
Or she could do something that uh, up to a, about a year ago I didn't think worked, which I call Mega Team. <coughs> Mega Team is, uh, is something that, you know, your typical team can be about three to five programmers plus the other people on the team. If you're pairing, you can probably get up to about six to ten programmers. Beyond that, you can't really scale much further because then you, what you have happening is people start clinging to lanes. You can no longer have collective ownership, and you effectively get multiple teams. Uh, Ward Cunningham works in Portland, and I live in Portland. And I was talking to him recently. I said, Ward, what's, what's the largest team size you've seen successful uh, doing pairing or non-pairing? And he said, well, the largest team that he's seen was 30 developers but only about 12 of them were actually contributing successfully to the code base. It is possible, I think, to grow bigger than that. Uh, Menlo Innovation is a company in the US that does, uh, they have a book out called Joy Inc. Uh, Rich Sheridan is their president. Have, have, how many of you have heard of Menlo Innovation? Yeah, they're really interesting. Only a couple of people raised their hand. I definitely recommend that you check them out. Uh, they are a hardcore XP shop. They've got about 70 people in the company, 70 to 80 people in the company, and they, are, and they do outsource project development. So when people, uh, so people come to them and say, please help us build this piece of software. And they have a high, a very strong emphasis on user experience design and creating products that make a difference in the world. This 70 person company operates as one team. And the way they do it is by having strict pairing. So they actually assign pairs every week. They've got project managers who move, who assign the pair. So it's not self-organizing at all, which is sort of counter the way most teams work. Uh, they have project managers who assign the pairs on a weekly basis so that, uh, so that they can maximize knowledge of all the different projects that the company is working on. So anybody can work on any part of the code base at any time. Uh, I was in India a few months ago, and I happened. And Rich Sheridan was keynoting there, and I asked him, uh, "Rich, it seems like you have one big team. You have one single team." He said, "Yeah, that's true." I said, "What? How many of those people do you actually have working on the same product at the same time?" And he said, "The most I've, we've had is 30 people, and I think that's about as many as we could have." So that's sort of the natural limits. You can probably scale from about three to five people without pairing to six to 10, maybe 12 people with pairing. And then if you start being really rigorous in your practices and doing full-time pairing and, and very aggressively sharing knowledge between the team members and collective ownership and test-driven development and all this other stuff that we know is a good idea, you might be able to get to 30 people. And that's mega team. Blank faces. Okay, all together now. Mega team. One, one more time. Mega team. <laughs> I tried. I tried. <laughs> All right. So what does Liz decide to do? Liz decides that she wants to stick with full ownership teams. Uh, she doesn't think that her her team members would up would really go for the mega team idea because it requires a lot, a lot of control over the way people work. And she doesn't want to get into the collective, you know, she doesn't want to move in the direction of body style teams. She wants to move in the direction of full ownership teams. So she gives the teams joint commit rights to the code base. But then what she does is she said, your job is to fix this legacy code to break apart the responsibilities so that you can have full ownership teams. That's what's happening here. So that now we can go back to full ownership teams. So the lesson here is to use collective ownership to untangle your legacy code. Of course, her team continues to grow. Sloth Co. continues to be successful. And uh, billing gets increasingly complex. There's business rules, sales, specials, support interface. And uh, this all ties in with all the other parts of the system. It ties in with the admin, it ties in with the landing pages, it ties in with what signed in users see. 
So now Liz needs to have a team that is, has software that's used by every other team in the company. What does she do? Well, Liz creates a new team, uh, billing and accounts, and everybody uses that team's work. But she wants to have full ownership teams. She wants to decrease the dependencies between teams. So their job, this new billing and accounts team's job, their job is to not be a dependency anymore. The guiding principle in the company is if another team is providing something, is going to build something for you, but you can't use it as it exists right now, it doesn't exist at all. We're not going to rely on other people's roadmaps because when you do that, you start seeing these long delays. I'm waiting for you to get this done, and it's your fault. I'm not getting my work done. No, we don't work that way. If it doesn't exist, we either build it ourselves or we change our plans. Or we make our plans in a way that manages risk. We say, we're going to go this, we're going to go down this path, and if they're ready, then we'll do this, and if they're not ready, we're going to, do a, we're going to go this direction instead. Now, there's, there's various ways of creating these facilitated self-service opportunities, these opportunities for teams to solve their own problems. Uh, one way is, for example, you might have an infrastructure team. So you could have an internal platform as a, they could provide an internal platform as a service product. Uh, that's uh, something that I've seen a number of companies do that they say have been very successful. Uh, the company I'm working with right now is, has, a, has a team called Metal as a Service that provides infrastructure resources. Uh, you can also, it, it's very common when you have a team that's providing software to others, either as a microservice a not microservice, or as a library, it's very common to think about how can I make other people's lives easy? But when you make those guesses wrong, or when you don't provide everything that they need, now they can't solve their own problems anymore. You become a dependency for them. So in addition to providing those cooked APIs in your services and libraries, I also suggest providing raw APIs, something that's really bare bones, to be, so people can consume the data that you have, while also building on top of that data to build what they need. And then if enough teams start doing that, remember, you're going to see some replication, uh, some duplication in this model. Uh, if enough teams start doing that, then your team can see that and say, oh, we'll, we'll provide a, this larger, more cooked API as well. By the way, when you're building your own, when you're having full ownership teams and you're getting some duplication across teams, it's very tempting as programmers to say, we don't want duplication. We need to dry this up. But the cost and delay of introducing a whole new team as a dependency for your work is so much larger than having that duplication that you need to be very careful about it. I don't know what the line is, but I do know that if two teams are doing the same thing, it costs a day of programming effort, it's not worth creating a new team for. Because you're going you're gonna to get way more than a day of cost associated with that. But if two teams are doing the same thing, maybe you're creating a, your own graph database or full text searching database or whatever, and it's going to cost you six months to a year to do it, yeah, you probably want a new team for that. In between, I'm not so sure. A week. Probably not. A week of duplicated effort, you're still going to consume more than a week if you introduce a new dependency. A month of duplicated effort, that might be worth it. Again, six months to a year, almost certainly worth it. Where exactly that line is, it's one of those things I haven't figured out yet. And of course, uh, there's various architectural options for providing these self-service uh, capabilities as well to do plugins, uh, having ways for teams to sort of build in their pieces into the application. So the lesson here is that when you must have shared teams, shared services or shared libraries, and eventually you will if you grow enough, design those libraries to enable self-service. Now, of course, Slothco continues to grow, and Liz discovers uh, that she's neglected to hire enough UX designers. 
Also, security issues are becoming more and more of a concern, but it's not enough of an issue that every team needs their own dedicated security person. Remember, she has cross-functional teams, so she so the teams have all the skills necessary in order to build everything, but she doesn't really want to hire a highly experienced security person for every team. It doesn't make sense. She does want to hire a UX person for every team, but she hasn't done it yet, so she's got a problem. So what she does is she creates some consulting teams. She takes her user experience designers and she puts them on a team. And she takes her security experts and she puts them on a team and she starts hiring more in both categories. And says, your job is to enable the other teams to work cross-functionally. There's a bunch of different ways you can do this. Uh, you can create a community of practice. That's just basically a user group for your teams. You can create a standards body that's like a community of practice, but puts more, um, more bite behind their decisions. Uh, she could also have rotating embedded experts. So she could have her security folks actually go and join teams as needed to help them with security issues. Uh, she could have on-call consultants. The designers, when, when it's time to do some UX, uh, UX design work, the team could actually do the design work, but ask the designers for assistance. Uh, she could have a sign-off and review uh, approach where there's basically a list of things that you must do before you release anything into the market from a security perspective and make sure you check all of these things. Or she could just provide documentation and training. The, teams, the security team and the UX team could do any one of these things or multiple of them. But the company I'm working with right now, they have both of these situations. They have a, a dedicated security team it's actually not part of the product organization. It's part of the larger, uh, larger organization. And she has a UX team, and they have a UX team. The, uh, for the security team, what they've done, how many of you have been in an environment with a security team, a, a separate security team? Go ahead and put your hands up. About, again, 10%. Keep your hands up for a moment. How many of you found that those people really get in your way? My hands are going up higher, way <laughs> higher. Look at that. Nobody put their hands down that I could see. Well, you can put your hand down now. Thanks. Um, what's amazing about this company is that their security team doesn't get in people's way. And they have four people on the security team serving 40, over 40 teams. And the way they do this is through sign off and review and that checklist of things that you are expected to do. Uh, for security. So the security team doesn't have to directly review your code. They just create the standards. They, they do the standards body plus sign up review plus documentation and training. They, uh, they say this is what we expect from a security expect perspective for your team to do. We are available for us to help you if you have requests. We will keep track of all the latest things that are going on and let you know about it and we'll update our list. And what we need you to do before you ship anything is to go through the checklist. And that's what teams do. And amazingly, when I asked this company, does security get in your way, it didn't come up as an issue. For the design team, what they're doing is the rotating embedded experts. Uh, when a team needs user experience design, they have somebody from the design team assigned to the team for that uh, iteration for that sprint. Uh, but that, that's not working quite as well. They don't have enough designers. And so they're trying to hire more designers and create cross-functional teams with designers on the team. So the lesson here is to use those consultative teams to enable ownership on your team. So now this has eight teams. Uh, it's getting hard to keep track of everything that's going on. So she, so there's too many people and too many teams for her to really understand what the issues are. So she looks at lean manufacturing, and they have something called an ondo signal. How many of you have heard of ondo signals? It's basically a light that is, I only saw about three people that raised their hands. So uh, an ondo signal is a light in an ondo manufacturing line that you'll see in the Toyota production system and other lean manufacturing inspired ideas. Uh, that, well, to be clear, Toyota production inspired the manufacturing, which inspired this and other companies. And 
the light basically says we have a problem and we need management to help out. So she applies this ongoing system idea to her team. Red, every team has a virtual light. They don't have a physical light like this. They have a virtual light that can be either red, green, or red, yellow, or green. Red means we're blocked by a dependency or something else that's outside of our control, or we're about to be blocked by something that's outside of our control. Yellow means we're slowed down by something that's outside of our control, or we're about to be slowed down. And green means we're not blocked or slowed down. Everything is under our control. This notably does not mean we are on schedule. It just means, are we in control? It's a signal for management to come help out. I have to tell you, of all the ideas that I'm sharing, this is the one I have least experience with. We are trying, with it. We are trying it at the company I'm at right now. It's early signs point to success. But whether or not this is a good idea uh, in practice, this is one of those things that uh, is still evolving. But that's the eighth idea. I'm not going to call this one a lesson yet, actually. Let's call that an idea. Use the ongoing signals to understand your system. And then finally, uh, there's too much going on for Liz to keep track of. She's got the on-node signals, and that's giving her good information about where teams are being blocked, what kind of dependencies are showing up in her system, but she can't personally manage it all. So she takes some of her most experienced uh, developers, and she forms an architecture team. And the role of this architecture team is not to do what most architecture teams do, which is sit back in the ivory tower and make pronouncements about how to develop code. But instead, they go out and they join the teams they actually work with team members and they look and they pay attention to those on dope signals and they look for mismatches between teams and their responsibilities, look for those opportunities and patterns for reuse, and help the team, uh, help the system continuously adapt and improve. They're coaching the teams and the team's coaches in doing high quality work. And it's a supportive role, not a dictatorial role. So that's the ninth lesson. This is something I am doing. I finally got a, a company to actually do this. It's working really well so far. Uh, but again, ask me again in a year and I'll have new ideas for you. So we started late. I think I'm on time, but we are just about done here. Nine lessons for you. As you are successful, you will probably grow. And as you grow, you're gonna have to deal with cross-team uh, cross dependencies. Yeah, if you're going to take a picture, this is a picture, the slide to take a picture of. The, uh, as you grow, you're going to face different problems. The very first one is team is the resource. Uh, use all those good agile engineering practices. Use the XP stuff. Swarm your stories and, and features. Get done faster. Make more money. Uh, second, when you start having to grow into multiple teams working on the same product, you're now in the class of problems I call large-scale agile. The key thing there is to minimize cross-team dependencies. Don't split your teams by layer. Instead, create full ownership teams. That will not work in every case. Sometimes you'll need to use collective ownership to untangle that legacy code. Sometimes you'll design shared software that enables full ownership. And sometimes you'll use consultative teams to enable full ownership. As that system gets larger, and I don't know where it is. I, I worked with a team, a company that had seven teams. They didn't need to do anything special. But the company I'm working with right now with over 40 teams, they do. So as you get larger, you're going to need to understand what's going on. The ongoing signals can help you there. And an architecture team will help you manage the overall system. The real lesson here, though, the real lesson here is that the way we build software matters. This is, we are working on software development. When we're building software, we can't ignore what's going on in the software itself. So as you're looking at scaling or really any other problem, don't say, oh, we're just gonna use some generic project management techniques. We're gonna use some generic team organization mechanisms. We well, can steal ideas from other disciplines like the on-dome signals, but we have to adapt them for what really happens in software development. So the next two days are filled with practical guidance about building software. So as you're here, listen, learn, apply the ideas, teach, 
We've got the open space sessions. They are fantastic for learning from real practitioners. So take advantage of them. That's enough for me. Enjoy the conference.